Um, so we're just we're gonna get started. Um, uh, today, welcome again to the lectures and planning series. Uh, today we have Ingrid Gould Ellen, who is the Paulette Goddard Professor in Urban Planning and uh, Urban Policy and Planning, and the Faculty Director at the NYU Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Um, Professor Ellen's research interests center on housing and urban policy. She's the author of Sharing America's Neighborhoods, The Prospect of Stable Racial Integration, and more recently, the editor of The Dream, uh, the Dream Revisited Contemporary Debates about Housing Segregation and Opportunity. Um, she has written numerous peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters relating to housing policy, community development, and school and neighborhood segregation. Uh, Professor Ellen has held visiting positions at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Urban Institute, and the Brookings Institution. She attended Harvard University, where she received a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics, an MPP, and a PhD in public policy. Uh, with that, let's please welcome Professor Ingrid Gould Ellen. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I, I should say up front that I'm also, um, I'm very happy to take questions throughout if you have, if you have questions, especially questions of clarification, but really any questions. Um, um, and, you know, I'll also, there'll probably also be time at the end. Hopefully I'll leave time at the end as well, but, but feel free to, feel free to jump in. Um, um, I, I should say I'm doing something I, I don't usually do, which is maybe ill-advised, which is I'm sort of going to be um, bridging a lot of different papers, a lot of different um, projects that I've worked on, and trying to sort of tie them tie them together. So, um, and I, I will say I'm not I don't have all my co-authors listed here, but there are many of them. They come from um, lots of different backgrounds, planners and sociologists and legal scholars and economists, um, and so, but anyway, I, they, they, let me just, just generally give them, give them credit for this. So um, we have um, long expected homeowners to, to, um, to, resist, uh, to resist growth in, in, in their communities and to, and to, to oppose new development, um, especially multifamily development, most especially affordable multifamily development, um, large in large part I'm concerned that that development will reduce their property values. Um, but I, I really don't want to demonize um, NIMBY homeowners. Um, I think that we all, uh, we all see our, our communities as, um, you know, as havens and from which we draw strength and I think we naturally, it's almost instinctual, I think, to sort of defend them and protect them from change. Um, and in fact, recently we've even seen um, renters in, in urban neighborhoods and even affordable housing advocates uh, opposing change and, um, and, uh, and opposing development. And, and counter to traditional NIMBY uh, opponents of, of growth, uh, the, these activists question the premise that, um, that new development and, and new supply is going to reduce um, their pro reduce property values and rents. And some even argue that new development will increase the rents and prices of the immediately surrounding neighborhood. Um, but these, uh, Vicki Bean and Kathy O'Regan and I have sort of dubbed this new form of uh, this new type of, of development opponent supply skeptics. Um, and generally the supply skeptics are, you know, opposing proposals like, like this one to um, upzone East Harlem to allow for more development and more generally are, you know, argue for, for down zonings and um, growth moratorium and, and more rigorous uh, approval processes. There, and, and in fact, um, you know, there are, uh, many of them feel that, that by, that they can both sort of oppose growth, but also embrace inclusion. So many, like this, this is a, a, a homeowner, actually I don't know if it's a homeowner, but a, a resident in, in Minneapolis that both is sort of, you know, putting up signs to sort of oppose the Minneapolis 2040 plan, which, which bans single family um, zoning and allowed for higher density along transit corridors, and then also, you know, has it all are welcome here. So, so um, the new, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say that's contradictory, but I will say that the YIMBY, um, yes in my backyard activists, um, certainly argue that those positions are inherently contradictory because they see sort of the only path to a truly inclusive city 
is growth and, and allowing more allowing more housing. Um, and uh, this, the movement was, uh, the YIMBY movement started in Toronto about, about 10 years ago. And um, YIMBY activists generally argue for more housing, more affordable housing, more market rate rental housing, more condominiums, just more housing. And they see that, that uh, building more housing is, is, the, is really the only path to creating more um, cities that are more inclusive to, to newcomers, cities that are more walkable, and cities that are more environmentally sustainable. Um, they're, um, they're, and, and I think that this is sort of, the, there is this sort of, um, this represents this, this fundamental tension, the sort of NIMBY versus YIMBY tension between existing residents who resist changes to their neighborhoods on the one hand, and on the other hand, advocates for sort of uh, more housing, denser living patterns, and growth. And I, and I think this is something that, um, you know, as planners, this is sort of a, a, a key challenge for 21st century. It's also a key, it was a key challenge for 20th century planners, but certainly a key challenge for 21st century planners. Is how do you balance this desire for neighborhood stability against sort of broader societal interests in growth? And to what extent should we be adopting policies that um, to help people remain in neighborhoods that are physically unchanged, that are culturally unchanged, and that are demographically unchanged? And, and I think that you know, for, for many progressives, the answer to that question about the balance was easy when we were talking about, you know, wealthy white homeowners in exclusive single-family home suburbs like Scarsdale, right? I think that probably if I asked you, maybe I'll ask for a show of hands, right, how many of you would say we should let this wealthy community, um, you know, uh, pro prohibit the construction of a new multifamily apartment building, the opening of a homeless shelter, or the extension of a rail line? What would you say? Should we let them ban it? No. Okay. A lot of no's, right? But you might, your perspective might change if I asked you those very same questions, right, in the context of uh, a low-income urban neighborhood, a uh, community of color like, like East Harlem that is, that is pictured here, okay? And I'm, I'm going to come back to whether we should think about those contexts, whether those contexts matter. Um, I will come back in a little bit to that, to that question. But for now, I just want to argue that um, this, this tension between, um, you know, uh, uh, wanting to sort of... Uh, promote stability for the interests of, of legacy residents and stability and sort of broader societal interests and growth and change, I think, is runs through and is undergirds a lot of today's sort of current and most contentious urban policy debates, right? From gentrification to you know rent regulation to to residency preferences, um, even short-term rentals is not up on the list. Okay, and so what I would like to do today is sort of talk through. I'm going to focus on these first three, on gentrification, historic preservation, and rent regulation. Um, all three of which I have done uh, I've done research on, and all three of which I think um, character are characterized by this tension between the interests of legacy residents in community stability and broader societal interests in, in growth and change. Um, and, and I'm going to mostly talk about gentrification, which um, I think is probably the most the most difficult case for for um, for progressives. Um, and uh, and I've um, been doing some uh, and, and well and I, and there's uh, there's obviously there's growing concern uh, around and growing anxiety about gentrification in uh, in in cities across the country. You know, especially coastal cities. I don't have to tell a New York City audience that there's anxiety about gentrification, but it is also emerging um, in cities across the country, even in even in Detroit. Okay, and I and I don't and uh, let me sort of back up by saying that like, I do not want to. Um, a little, or uh, or you know, that uh, downplay the, the the anxiety that people feel about the changes that are going on in the neighbor in their neighborhoods. Right, people around the country, renters around the country, are facing crushing um, affordability pressures and, and and rent burdens, and they're genuinely concerned about their ability to stay in their homes. Um, 
but I think that the debate about about gentrification, right? Um, you know, and uh, certainly this is notwithstanding Lance's excellent work on the topic, but still the debate about gentrification generally takes place sort of in in kind of an empirical vacuum, and so. I have been building on, on Lance's work over the last couple of years and, and doing some research on, on gentrification and on the impacts of uh, causes, actually, also, although I'm not going to talk about that today, but the, uh, the consequences of gentrification. And, and I want to start by just sort of a few just basic facts to sort of just say that, that despite the fact that, especially in New York, we talk all the time about gentrification, I think it, it is important to just put that in context and say that even in the 21st century, that most low-income neighborhoods in this country remain persistently low-income, right? Most low-income neighborhoods are not seeing any signs of gentrification. Um, this just is one measure of gentrification um, that 85% uh, of um, neighborhoods that were around the country, of census tracts around the country that were low-income in 2000, um, either, uh, either experienced a loss in income between 2000 and 2014 or saw their incomes be stable. So only 15% actually saw significant gains. Yeah, from there. So this is, this is urban and um, urban, uh, this is just urban, sorry. Yeah, this is just urban. This is just central city neighborhoods, so good question. Yeah. Um, and there, um, and, and that being said, right, we have seen an, an increase in prevalence, right? That, that gentrification, um, people, it's not, you know, this is, it's, it's not unexpected that people are feeling more anxiety, that gentrification has become more common and more pervasive since uh, in, in the first decades of the 21st century as compared to the last two decades of the 20th century. And, and what these charts, I mean, and you can do this sort of, I've done this with multiple measures of, of gentrification, but this basically shows that the share, for instance, the share of, of um, low-income central city tracts that saw uh, large gains in the percentage of adults with college degrees relative to their metro rose from about sort of 25% in the 1980s and 1990s to 35% in the first decade of the 21st century, right? The share of low-income central city tracts that saw large gains in rent relative to the rest of the metropolitan area rose from like 10% in the 1990s to almost a quarter in, in, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century. So gentrification, again, it's still, you know, experience, it's a minority of neighborhoods, but it's a growing minority of neighborhoods. And, and this is happening, I mean, you know, you're seeing more gentrification on the coast, but you are seeing, um, uh, you know, maybe not Detroit, but you're seeing gentrification is, is uh, you know, many cities across the country are seeing some neighborhoods now experiencing gentrification. Um, and, and there are a lot of concerns about, about that gentrification, right? There's, and I want to start, I'm going to walk through all of these, but the, the first concern, and I think the one that's, that um, to a fault is kind of, I feel like that, you know, the conversation is, is almost exclusively focused on, on direct displacement and the, the, uh, the fear that gentrification will directly push people, legacy residents, out of, out of their homes and out of their communities. Um, and, and I have um, done some, written a couple papers over the last year using, on, gentr on the impacts of gentrification in New York City using New York State uh, Medicaid claims data. So this is, I think, one of the benefits of being in sort of a multidisciplinary school um, is that, you know, I have health, health colleagues who work with Medicaid data, and it turns out that Medicaid data have a lot of advantages for studying spatial urban issues. And, um, and spatial phenomenon that, um, first of all, they have a, 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 it's basically offer you a near universe of all the poor and near poor children in New York City, actually around New York State as well, but this paper just looks at, at New York City. And I think that, you know, poor children, these, this is the population we should arguably be most concerned about being affected by um, gentrification. Second, they're longitudinal, so they track children over time, so we can see children every single year. Right? Um, and we see, third, they have this incredible spatial detail, so we know the precise addresses where kids live every year. We can see them moving from, from one neighborhood, from one building to another. We know the exact building they live in. We know whether they live in subsidized housing. We can sort of look at whether they move to lower or higher quality buildings over time. Um, 
and and they also provide it also provides some um, some measure of outcomes of well-being, which is looking at um, you know sort of health and and well-being um, through it, albeit kind of more short term right now, but um, but we get we get some measure of that. So um, and and let me let me just say a minute about how we. Um, Defined um, gentrification. Now, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but it, you know, definitely let me know if you have if you have questions. But but essentially, what we do, which is sort of common, um, you know, in uh, in the research on gentrification, is is we start by identifying sort of the set of gentrifiable neighborhoods, which we I, which we um, define as the neighborhoods that are the the bottom 40 percent of neighborhoods in New York City with respect to income. So, the, um, that have the the forty percent of neighborhoods that have the lowest that had the lowest income in New York City as measured by the two thousand and five to two thousand and nine ACS, right? And then we divide those neighborhoods up into sort of three buckets depending on their trajectory of change between two thousand five two thousand nine ACS and two thousand and um, two thousand and eleven to twenty fifteen ACS. Okay, and uh, the first are those that rapidly gentrify, and so they were they experience sort of top decile growth in socioeconomic status. Those that moderately gentrify, so those that experience growth in socioeconomic status between the tenth and the twenty fifth percentile, and that those that we we say remain persistently low socioeconomic status, and those that are in the bottom seventy fifth percentile. Okay, we do. Um, in in this um, in the in these papers, we experiment with multiple definitions of of neighborhood geographies. We look at sort of larger neighborhood geographies, the, the neighborhood tabulation areas that, that city planning produces. Uh, um, we look at multiple measures of changes in socioeconomic status. We look at changes in income. We look at changes in rent. We look at changes in the percentage of adults with college degrees. I'm going to focus on that latter just for today. I will say the results are very consistent across the different measures that we use. I think we use 10 different measures of gentrification. But I like the, um, the growth in percent of adults with college degrees, degrees because it, it sort of, it, it more, um, you can be more certain that that's capturing an increase in the entry of, of new higher income households rather than just sort of, uh, you know, the um, incumbent upgrading it, it, that, uh, that, you know, the existing legacy rent, Residents may be seeing um, increases in income, and it also captures the entry of sort of young, professional, college-educated professionals who might not have high incomes today, but they have high earning potentials, and therefore they can spend more on rent, right? And um, and so that may be significant. So okay, so this just shows you the sort of the, the map of um, the rapidly gentrifying, the moderately gentrifying, the persistently low income. Um, neighborhoods. You can see that the gentrifying neighborhoods tend to sort of cluster in, in North Brooklyn, on the Queens waterfront, Upper Manhattan. Um, they're a little sort of further radiated away from kind of core Manhattan because this is sort of a later stage of, of gentrification, the period that um, we're looking at. Um, there, um, in terms of our sample, basically what we do is we look at the, um, the universe of, of children on Medicaid, right? So these are poor and near poor children who were born in New York City between 2006 and 2008. So we look at this cohort. They lived in, and they lived in multifamily rental housing in 2000, and in December 2009. We don't want to, we don't want to capture homeowners, right? And they are um, continuously enrolled. They were continuously enrolled in Medicaid. So we make sure that we can see them every year. Now that does diminish the sample because there are some kids who cycle on and off of Medicaid, but there's no difference in the attrition rates between the kids who were born into neighborhoods that rapidly gentrify and those that remain persistently low socioeconomic status. So, and and when we when we don't when we relax that restriction, we get the same. So, let me just sort of show you. I'm just going to show you sort of pictorially kind of what we do. So, um, I hope this is I hope this is helpful. So, so great. Um, not that we would want to do this ethically, but like as a researcher, what you'd really want to do is randomly assign people to different neighborhoods, right? You'd want to sort of randomly assign similar kids, some to sort of drop into a neighborhood that then gentrifies, and some to drop into a neighborhood that looks exactly the same today, but that will, that will later, um, re that will remain persistently low income. Now, obviously, we can't do that, right? 
But what we can do is we can sort of, uh, you know, try to approximate that by selecting children who, again, are born, these are all um, poor and near poor children who are born in similar buildings in observationally identical neighborhoods, both in terms of current socioeconomic status and, and past trends, um, and, and, um, and then, and, and, and then but, that's, but some were born into neighborhoods that, that then, that experienced a different trajectory that, that gentrified between 2009 and 2015, and some were born into neighborhoods that remain persistently low, um, you know, high poverty or, or, or low income, okay? Um, over that period, and then we track the outcomes. We then observe the outcomes of those sort of two different two different sets of kids, um, and we track their mobility patterns between 2009 and 2015. And we also track their their neighborhood and health outcomes in 2015. We compare them uh, their neighborhood and health outcomes in 2015 to 2017. Okay, so does that kind of make sense as the as the research setup? Okay. Um, Figure that's as goofy as that picture is. It's better than the equations, right? So, okay. So, w what do we find in, in terms of results? The first thing that, and I really want to emphasize this, right, is just look at the difference between the bars, uh, the market rate, and the subsidized bars, right? So, there are that that children who live in um, these these uh, poor and near poor kids who live in subsidized housing are much less likely to leave their homes and their neighborhoods, right, over this period, okay? Much less likely. Um, and uh, they're, they, you know, they're much more stably housed, okay? However, right, the second thing to notice, though, is that there is no difference within these groups, there's no difference in the mobility rates of the kids who are born um, who you know, sort of, who who were sort of born into market rate rental housing uh, in gentrifying neighborhoods, and you know, even for these in market rate housing, those that are born into gentrifying neighborhoods, and those that are born into persistently neighborhoods that remain persistently low income. Okay. Yeah. So where does rent stabilization? So rent stabilization um, is is well, rent stabilization is in both buckets actually. The way the city. The way the city works, um, you know, we don't have. Um, Pernima certainly knows this, right? We don't have great data on um, the uh, on, on rent stabilized stock. We, there's a data set that's publicly available that tells you whether there's at least one rent stabilized unit in the building. That's the only thing that's publicly available, and um, and so we we use that. It didn't make any difference. So we just, but we don't think it's great data. So we basically are just defining these. So there are going to be some stabilized um, buildings, which I which I think is well, when we'll come to this, right? That's relevant for generalizability, right? And Lance has certainly made this point, right, in the work that he's done in New York, right? That that New York City does have more robust tenant protections than than many cities. So. <coughs> I think I can. I'm going to talk a little bit about work in other cities, but you should take this as findings about New York City. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm going to show that a little bit. There are very few of them, and and it didn't it didn't vary. Actually, kids kids. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the kids actually in persistently low income neighborhoods were more like slightly more likely to move out of New York City altogether, which was surprising. Yeah. So. Um, so, so basically, like I said, we're seeing we see no difference between um, in the the rates of residential mobility that their kids who are born into neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods that then gentrify, are no more likely to leave their homes than kids who are born into neighborhoods that the low income neighborhoods that remain persistently low income. Okay, but I want to be clear because I feel like this finding is often, and Lance, I know you have found this right that this finding is often misinterpreted. Say, oh, there's no displacement, right? Lance Freeman says there's no displacement. Okay, that's not what Lance Freeman says, right, this work says, and it's not what this work says, right? What this work says is that there's no evidence that displacement and mobility are any higher in gentrifying neighborhoods than they are than, uh, than they are in other neighborhoods, right? What it says is that people are, families with children are no more likely to be displaced in gentrifying neighborhoods, but they're displaced in all sorts of neighborhoises, okay? Yeah. Is the 
is that roughly the same between gentrified and? Yeah, 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 it is. That's a good, that's a good question. So I don't think I'm going to show that. But um, so. Um, and then, but I'm saying, but in some ways also, this is a, this is a limited question, right? Because it could be that, okay, well, maybe what's going on is that the kids and the families who are leaving gentrifying neighborhoods are, um, are less likely to make sort of um, upwardly mobile moves and more likely to make downwardly mobile moves. So maybe they're less likely to sort of, uh, you know, voluntarily move, but they're more likely to involuntarily move and sort of on net, it, 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 there's no difference in overall mobility. Because overall mobility, maybe that's not really a very good measure. And so what, what can we do? I mean, we can't really see. We don't know when people are pushed out. Uh, but what we can do is look at the neighborhoods that changes whether people move to different neighborhoods. And so what we do, if you look at the movers, this shows the change, the difference in the poverty rate between their um, the, the, the uh, neighborhood that they moved to and the neighborhood where they started, and you can see basically there is there is no difference, right? Basically, both the kids, the, the families with kids who are leaving gentrifying neighborhoods and persistently low-income neighborhoods are basically moving into neighborhoods that have the same poverty rates um, as as their origin neighborhoods. Now, when you look at non-movers, the families that stay in place those that stay in gentrifying neighborhoods actually see a reduction in the poverty of their neighborhood of, of about um, close to two percentage points, and those that, are, um, that stay in persistently low-income neighborhoods actually experience an increase in, in neighborhood poverty of about two and a half percent. So, so on net, if you look sort of an aggregate at low-income kids who, who sort of are born into neighborhoods that then gentrified, they end up in lower poverty environments than those that are born into um, neighborhoods that remain persistently low income. Okay, but that's driven by the stayers and not by the movers. Right now, um, it, it there there is some difference in the mobility patterns across um, across. Um, I mean, this is to to, to Bernadette's question um, in uh, between. Um, movers from gentrifying neighborhoods and movers from persistently low-income neighborhoods, and particularly the movers from gentrifying neighborhoods move farther away. They move to, to homes that are farther away from their existing homes, and they're more likely to move to a different zip code. They're more likely to move to another borough. Now, these are not huge differences. They're, I think these are relatively small differences, but they may feel really salient to people. So, you know, this could be, this could be um, meaningful to people. Um, now, again, is this just New York? Okay. Well, I think that, um, and I should, Lance, I should have, have your, these are just sort of the two, the two most recent studies up here, but Lance's work, national work, basically doesn't find evidence of, of much um, of heightened mobility in gentrifying neighborhoods and cities across the country. Um, Lei Ding and, and Jackie Huang have found, uh, they found no evidence of heightened mobility in gentrifying neighborhoods um, in, in Philadelphia, but they did find that when disadvantaged um, uh, renters move from gentrifying areas, they tend to move to um, somewhat higher poverty areas. Now, um, Quentin Brummett and, and Davin Reed more recently looked at um, a, a very terrific paper where they link um, decennial census to ACS using internal census data. And they find modest increases in 15-year mobility um, for less educated renters in gentrifying neighborhoods across the country. They find that movers over this period, the, the less educated, these are renters without any college education, um, I think 68% of them moved. In over this long time period in, in the persistently low income neighborhoods as compared to 72 percent in, um, in gentrifying neighborhoods. But they, and, but they found no difference that they were pushed to, to higher poverty or more disadvantaged neighborhoods. And so these, you know, these findings are you know, a little bit contradictory, but I'd say that the consistent finding is that we're not seeing sort of wholesale displacement. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. They're mostly moving to very similar neighborhoods where they started. So, so I don't think they're they're you know they're not moving to neighborhoods where they would be perceived as as very different necessarily. So generally, so so but again, um, so. 
you know, again, even if there isn't wholesale displacement, right, there is still, there's still other costs to, to gentrification. And again, displacement still, still certainly happens. Um, first is an increase in cost of living. Okay? Um, and, you know, it, it's very clear that rents increase in gentrifying neighborhoods more than they increase, and it's almost by definition, more than they increase in persistently low-income neighborhoods, especially since 2000 that's happened. But the rent increase actually may not be as large. There's some research that suggests that rent increase is not as large for vulnerable legacy renters. Partially, some of them live in subsidized housing. And then, um, again, uh, Quentin Drummond and Davin Reed, they actually find that renters without college degrees see uh, no increase in rent in gentrifying neighborhoods because they argue that they're living this sort of the housing market is segmented and they're living in, in, in the types of housing that aren't as attractive to, to gentrifiers. But, you know, I think we don't, we, we, we need more research here. And I think, that, and they're very, there's very little research on, on other costs, other like, you know, things like day-to-day -day costs like groceries. Um, there, okay, I, I sort of stuck this in, really, but okay. Um, which is this, is, this is actually research from my doctoral student, Jody Lee. But I, but I also just wanted to say that there's also a lot of um, concern that, and a lot of debate right now um, about whether or not new development, new market rate development of, of, of housing and new high rises increase um, rents and prices in the immediately surrounding area. And there's, um, I think, two really good new papers. Jowdy is, is one of them, and also a paper by uh, uh, Brian Asquith, Evan Mast, and, and Davin Reed, um, two of whom are from the Upjohn Institute, uh, which finds basically they use kind of similar methods and find that market rate housing does not increase the prices and rents of, of, uh, of nearby properties, despite I think what, what many believe to be true. Yeah. That's New York City. Right? This is just New York City, but the other research that um, Brian As Asquith and, and Mast and Reed do is is national. They look in 25 cities around the country. It would seem the control would be rent regulation adjacent. Yeah, I mean, this is basically. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically, she's looking at. The, the, her strategy is to sort of look at um, new, new uh, apartments, the um, it changes in rents surrounding new market rate development, uh, new high rises that are built, and um, market rate high rises, as compared to um, the prices and rents surrounding parcels where developers have received permits to build, but there's, there was sort of, for idiosyncratic reasons, there was a delay. So these are both places where developers want to build, but when the building actually goes up, you don't you see actually, if anything, reductions in rents in the immediately surrounding area. Okay, um, okay. so there's also, um, I think, a significant concern about what I think Peter Marcus first called labeled sort of secondary displacement, which is basically describing the fact that when gentrification happens, that it makes it more difficult for low income families in the future to, to move back into, to, to continue to move into that neighborhood. And I think this is something that is um, incredibly important and not talked about as much. Um, that said, not every, not every gentrifying neighborhood completely resegregates. So, um, well, let me just say that, that we're doing, I'm doing some work with actually someone now who's on the sociology, to, in the sociology department here at Columbia, looking at sort of the long run stability of, of, uh, of incomes in gentrifying neighborhoods and we're finding kind of, there's, there's a lot of variation. So there are a lot of neighborhoods that, that gentrify and then they remain, they, they may see, um, you know, they, they remain sort of, they're, they're, they see little income change after that. Um, and uh, some see continued increase, some see decline, but there's a lot of variation. And there's similarly a lot of variation when we look at um, racial um, change in gentrifying neighborhoods. So this is a, a paper where we looked at the long run trajectory of predominantly minority tracks that gentrified during the 80s and 90s. And this shows that of the predominantly minority neighborhoods that gentrified during the, 19, um, during the 1980s, uh, Basically, two thirds of them remained predominantly minority. That in uh, uh, 36 years later, in 2016, about a third of them were were racially had transitioned to become racially integrated, and only four percent had um, had sort of resegregated to become predominantly white. Okay. Now, the the big caveat here is that um, you know 
we can only look long term at neighborhoods that gentrified historically, the neighborhoods that are gentrifying today are more likely to be experiencing racial change as they gentrify. So, you know, I, I think probably you would see more racial change if, if I, you know, did this, uh, you know, 20, 30 years from now and showed you these pictures of, of the racial composition of neighborhoods that, that gentrified during the 2000s, but obviously we can't, we can't do that yet. Um, no, this is national. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm flipping back and forth. This is national. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, you know, it is that there's more racial change in New York. We should pull out New York. We did, and now I don't remember. But, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as I thought it was going to be. But it is, there is more racial change in New York. Um, so the, the, um, the last set of concerns I want to talk about about gentrification are the most difficult to sort of quantify, um, which are, but that doesn't make them any less important, which is anxiety and fear of displacement and also concerns about cultural displacement, right? The idea that people feel as their neighborhoods change, that they feel anxious about being able to stay in their communities. They feel, they feel sort of alienated from the changes. They feel like their, their, um, their history, their culture, their communities are, are being, uh, being erased and taken away from them. So, um, and so that again, difficult to quantify. One thing we did with the Medicaid data is we did look at changes in, um, in uh, the, uh, diagnoses of, of kids, um, of the share of kids diagnosed with anxiety or depression. And we did see that's a place where we saw a significant change. So now um, that we saw kids who were grown up, who were born into neighborhoods that then gentrified were more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety. Sort of, um, now these are these are small differences. They were very significant. Um, they are, it is very statistically significant and robust. But because it's small, because you know, a lot of there are not that many kids that actually are are diagnosed with anxiety and depression at this age. So I think we we hope to sort of follow these kids over time, and as they track what happens as they age into um, later adolescence, when anxiety and, di and uh, depression are more common. But we saw no other physical health <coughs> differences. So so another thing that I did is that we worked on a study of, a few years ago, sort of a mixed method study, where we looked at the experience of public housing residents in, in gentrifying or gentrified neighborhoods like the Chelsea neighborhood. We looked at the, um, we hired uh, local public housing residents, sort of young adults to be, serve as community ethnographers and do, um, do uh, rapid ethnographic assessments of, of their neighborhoods. And it was, it was fascinating, we found, I mean, for, I'm just pulling out some quotes from Chelsea that, that the residents really appreciated um, some of the changes that, that were happening in their neighborhood. They particularly appreciated the, the greater safety that they sensed, the sense that there was so, so much activity going on. On the other hand, they felt like they weren't necessarily seeing expanded opportunities. They felt like the changes weren't for them. They didn't feel like they had a voice in the changes. Um, and they felt like they, they really felt sort of a, a concern about the disappearance of, of um, the neighborhood retail, which they felt like this was one mom and pop shop, um, which they described as sort of a, a, a comforting part of the, of the environment. So, um, so the effects, I think, are, are more nuanced than many critics assume. Um, gentrification may not force many um, more legacy renters to move. Renters end up in similar lower poverty neighborhoods. There doesn't seem to be, there seems to be little or no effect on long run employment, earnings, physical health. But change still may bring costs, right? And that's in terms of a higher cost of living and a sense of anxiety, alienation, and a loss of belonging. Okay. Um, there are other debates, let me just really quickly say there are other debates that sort of pit advocates of, of, of um, stability against proponents of growth and change for historic preservation. Um, this shows the lovely neighborhood of, of Brooklyn Heights. Um, historic protections can benefit current residents by creating certainty um, about future development, helping to build social cohesion. Um, and maybe strengthening na neighborhood identity, but at the same time, these supply restrictions may lead to, um, they're gonna limit growth, lead to higher uh, prices and rents, and may actually um, serve as exclusionary barriers and lead to sort of uh, uh, demographic changes in a neighborhood. And uh, I've done some, um, co-authored a paper with uh, Brian McCabe and Gerard Torres Espinosa showing that after neighborhoods are de designated in New York City, uh, designated in a historic district, they, they on average experience a reduction in poverty and an increase in the share of adults with college degrees. Um, 
So that's another trade-off. Rent regulation is another really good example, right? On the one hand, rent regulation, the battles about rent regulation are heating up around the country. They pit sort of, uh, you know, existing residents against the development community and, and, and landlords. I mean, but, you know, rent regulation on the one hand benefits existing renters by shielding them from large rent increases, allowing them, helping them to stay in their homes and communities and preserving the fabric of existing communities. On the other hand, um, rent regulation um, is, is uh, limits the growth and entry of new renters, right? by um, reducing the number of rental homes overall, by increasing rents in the uncontrolled stock, and, and that it may facilitate discrimination as well. So, so how do we balance, right, again, as planners, right, how do we balance these competing interests? How do we balance the interests of residents, legacy residents, of staying in place, of feeling secure, of feeling at home, against these societal interests in community change and expanding the supply of housing, inviting new households into cities and accommodating growth, increasing population density to make cities more sustainable, breaking up segregated living patterns, right? How do we balance this tension? And does it matter? Should we be thinking differently about how to balance this tension in Scarsdale as compared to East Harlem, okay? And I think the answer is yes, we should be thinking differently. Um, and I'm going to, you know, I'm running out of time, but I'll just say that I think the residents of, you know, and, and let me say there's sort of four differences, right? One is um, ability to exit. So I think residents of, of um, lower income urban neighborhoods are often less able to exit and move to, to sort of exercise the exit option, right? Both because of their, their lower incomes and because of, often because of their racial backgrounds, it's they, have, they face a more limited set of alternative neighborhoods, um, and they also may be sort of more tied to the social networks in the neighborhood and make it more difficult for them to leave. They're less able to exercise voice. Residents of low-income um, urban neighborhoods, they wield less um, political power um, uh, over their local governments in suburban neighborhoods. Often, I mean, suburban residents often have more ho homogeneous interests. Uh, you know, uh, the, the legacy residents of urban neighborhoods are competing with other neighborhoods to, to, to sort of get the um, attention and to persuade their, um, their government. They also, suburbs are more likely to have access to sort of public and private land use controls. Um, uh, third, local culture urban neighborhoods are more likely to have uh, um, minority ethnic cultures that um, that you know that that we might feel that are that are more that are more important to to help people um, help help their residents and help support residents. You, know, you think about what is it, what culture are you preserving in sort of an affluent white suburb, and and why would you need to preserve that culture when they are part of the dominant culture in society? And and finally, density. I mean, urban you know urban neighborhoods are already high density in many cases, right? They're sort of higher density. So, so I think there, there are good reasons to think, to be more deferential to, to um, interests in, in neighborhood stability in lower income urban neighborhoods, but that doesn't mean we should halt all growth. We, right, we still need more housing. Um, and so the question is, what can we do? Well, from policy responses, well, I, I think there are some policies that we can adopt to, to mitigate costs and enhance benefits for existing residents, um, and I think there are some policies we can adopt to sort of ensure some long-run stable diversity in neighborhoods. And I, maybe I'll just go through these really quickly and then just take questions about them. But, but in terms of mitigating costs and enhancing benefits, we can help legacy renters stay in their homes, but again, in all neighborhoods not just gentrifying neighborhoods, right? Because residents, low-income residents in cities like New York, they're vulnerable in every single neighborhood, not just gentrifying neighborhoods. We can, we can work with local businesses and community groups to connect residents to emerging opportunities in legacy residents to emerging opportunities in their neighborhoods, to jobs, to job training, to maybe after school. We can invest in social infrastructure to help and that helps to promote a, a sense of belonging. So, you know, I think that the, the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture in, in, in Harlem, I think, is, is, a, is a great example of the kind of social infrastructure, the kind of cultural institution that brings people together, that celebrates um, the, the uh, black culture, that celebrates also the history of, of the neighborhood. Um, 
there, I think you can also, we can partner with um, community-based organizations who can help sort of engage local residents in local civic life and help resolve cultural conflicts. The Hudson Guild is one of my fits, a settlement house. Uh, one of the, you know, there are a number of settlement houses across the city, but um, it's a terrific one in, in Chelsea that works with the residents of, of, uh, of the public housing um, campuses of, in, in Chelsea, but also integrates the rest of the community. Um, we can incorporate legacy retailers into redevelopment plans. Um, the Flatbush, um, the Caton Market in Flatbush is a nice example of this. This was an outdoor market that had about 40 Caribbean merchants, and when there's sort of a new development proposal in the neighborhood, um, that actually they incorporated, they sort of gave the, the they're giving the, the, uh, the market a space, an indoor space inside that will allow them to operate um, through, through all seasons. So, so, you know, these are hard questions and mitigating costs, right? Whose interests should we prioritize, right? Is it the residents who have lived in the long neighborhood longer? Is it the local merchants? Is it residents with children? Is it residents who, you know, who belong to ethnic communities? Whose voices are heard, right? Who are the self-designated neighborhood representatives who sort of claim to speak for, claim to speak for the neighborhood? Um, and so, but I think, you know, there are things we can do to sort of make people continue to feel like they, they belong in the community and and we can ensure some um, do more to sort of lock in the diversity over the longer over the longer run right it turns out again neighborhoods change not because of who moves out whoops I just went on my screen that's fine it's there um, not because of who moves out of them but because of who moves into them and so we need to ensure that we have a diversity of housing we're building and preserving a diversity of housing in in gentrifying neighborhoods to to ensure that sort of the door stays open to a variety of of households and uh, and uh, with different income levels over the over the longer term and that we can create new affordable housing we can preserve subsidized housing it turns out that actually we did work at the Furman Center that, that I think 12% of all the housing in, in neighbor and community districts that, that we deemed um, as gentrifying are public housing units and another quarter are privately owned um, um, subsidized housing uh, units. So this is, an, you know, this, this is a, um, a really important source of, of anchoring and a uh, long run diversity in the neighborhood. So, you know, I think that none of these debates that I'm highlighting today are new. I, I think there is a sense that they feel uh, that the stakes are higher today, that they feel more urgent. Um, there are, uh, you know, there is now, now it's not just developers who are arguing for growth, it's increasingly YIMBY advocates um, who are arguing for growth um, as, as a way to both address climate change and also as a way to, um, to address the housing crisis, There's, there is a growing concern. I think the fact that sort of rents continue to rise and rent burdens are, are climbing up the um, economic ladder means that they're touching a, a broader swath of the population, feels sort of the pain of the rental affordability crisis. But that also means, that's also pushed, uh, I think, legacy more legacy renters to, to dig in and feel anxious and fearful that there's sort of a vanishing set of alternative neighborhoods where they can afford to live. Okay? Um, and I think there's also mounting concerns about cultural displacement in this political environment where people feel like their culture isn't, isn't valued and um, many communities feel threatened by the, by the increased influx of, of young white college graduates. So, so, you know, I'm not going to resolve this debate today. I certainly have not resolved this debate in this last 45 minutes. Um, and I'm not sure it can ever be fully resolved. I, I think that, um, I think that, but I do think we need to figure out ways to sort of push for change that can at least preserve some of the fabric. I mean, push for growth at the same time, preserving some of the fabric of urban neighborhoods. And while this may seem inherently contradictory, um, I think we can we can have some of the both and and I just you know sort of wanted to end with what I think is sort of a beautiful and poetic summation of sort of urban policy that from Adam Gopnik um, that you know cities are contradictions with street lights or else they're not cities at all. So thank you. Sorry to talk my use my New York voice. Um, around sort of neighborhoods in Harlem mm -hmm. and uh, in Inglewood, uh, 
uh, and so forth. There's maybe not as much growth versus stability, but actually um, competing types of growth. Um, I mean, these neighborhoods um, have a lot of immigrants. Um, and I know that, you know, there are Dominican households in, in Upper Manhattan um, that have been anchored in the neighborhood for decades, but that they also serve as kind of points of entry for more immigrants. Um, so um, I'm curious if there's research on that or if you're thinking about kind of like um, actually like different models for growth and like how yeah. housing types, like some housing yeah. types contribute to the growth of the yeah. young college educated and some right. housing types contribute to I mean, the problem is, is that what I think the research shows is that if you don't build housing, that those newcomers are going to come anyway, and what are they going to do? They're just going to bid up the price of the existing homes, and there's going to be a much greater risk of displacement than if you build new housing that can help to accommodate and absorb some of the demand for that neighborhood. Chris, is it like which types of housing are more? Um, you know, I mean, I think that in a... In my ideal world, right, we would be building a, a, a mix of different housing, with, you know, targeted to different income levels um, in, in communities. So we're not just building market rate housing, um, but but I think that you know we want to we want to build a range, and that's going to help to sort of again absorb to house some of those newcomers, so keep them from competing on the housing market for for existing units. Yeah. Has there been any work comparing different cities, for instance, Milwaukee, Memory, and Victory, and comparing that to New York City, which has strong rent regulation laws yeah. that were heavily strengthened last June when yeah. Democrats took over the state Senate, and also laws providing attorneys for tenants yeah. which help keep them in their, in their, in their apartments? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I mean, you know, again, Lance has done some of this work nationally. I think that the um, Davin Reed and Quentin Brummett have done this this work recently. I mean, the, the trick is is that there's sort of the national work covers more cities, but then you get a really small sample in each city, and so it's difficult to make meaningful comparisons across those cities. I mean, you know, look, New York does have more robust tenant protections, and that that may well help. To, um, to, to keep, to allow more uh, legacy renters to stay in their neighborhoods, right? And we also have more subsidized housing, although again, when we pull out the subsidized housing. Um, but so I think, I think all of those tools are, are important. It's just, my point is that we shouldn't be focusing those tools only on gentrifying neighborhoods, right? We should be, because you know, you've, got, you've got renters that are facing, you're seeing, um, rent increases and housing instability. And I think Matt Desmond's, you know, incredible book is is sort of case in point, is that he was he showed these, you know, that this incredible housing instability faced by low income families in neighborhoods that were seeing no sign of gentrification. Right? That wasn't about gentrification. That was about economic instability and yeah. Um, do you feel like the topic of gentrification gets an appropriate amount of attention in the discourse around housing? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think probably nationally it probably gets a little too much attention. Um, you know, I, I think, um, it, like I said, I, I just think it's, it's very salient to people right now. I think people are feeling these, these um, crushing rent burdens, but they're feeling crushing rent burdens in, um, in cities and in neighborhoods that are, that are not seeing any gentrification. And I worry a little bit that that the discourse um, often you see sort of uh, efforts to proposals to reinvest and make really important investments that will improve the quality of life in communities that are blocked out of concern that they're going to gentrify neighborhoods. And I think the answer can't be that we're not going to reinvest in low-income neighborhoods. Right? And so I worry a little bit that the pendulum has swung a little too far that um, that we we are we are too focused and in, in and again and I and I say that I don't mean to be I don't want to be diminishing the pain that that families and the anxiety legitimate anxiety that people are feeling but yeah Lance uh, 
Nice uh, enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. So you mentioned that you felt that um, communities of color should be viewed somewhat differently than other communities. How would you operationalize that? Or what would that mean in terms of Yeah, so I mean what I said was low income communities, right? And so I'm thinking sort of low-income neighborhoods, often they are more likely to be communities of color, right? So it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, it, in my perfect world, we would have some kind of a fair share system or a zoning budget system where every neighborhood would have to be um, taking on some new development, but I can imagine um, giving somewhat more deference to community planning um, in in lower income neighborhoods. There were, I mean, in, in um, the California SB 50 proposal that, you know, is now I think the third time that that bill has not, has not passed, has failed. But, um, but in this latest round, there was sort of more, there was, um, they gave communities uh, another couple years to develop community plans. Um, so, and more, and maybe more effort to sort of incorporate legacy retailers, more effort. So, so I think there there are ways to there are ways to do that. But again, I still think that we need we need growth everywhere. So I'm not I'm not letting every sort of different communities off the hook. But I do think that given the historic disinvestment and again given the lack of the, the differences in political power. Uh, the differences in, in the exit alternatives, I think we should be somewhat more differential. I mean, community preferences could be another one. I'm not a huge fan of community preferences, though. But, so, yeah, what do you think? Um, kind of recognizing the difference between doing something that's more than two Yeah. I, I do wonder about like, the, the, the time span and sensitivity yeah. of some of these yeah. uh, some of these numbers, and I wonder if that's something mm -hmm. that yeah. So do you mean in terms of if we looked a few more years out, would we see more displacement? I mean, yeah, so I'm definitely worried about the time span sensitivity of sort of the of the impacts. And I didn't talk much about that, but um, but we, we had a whole paper looking at health outcomes of children. I just showed one slide from that. And that one, look, we're only we're looking at very short term outcomes and. Um, and I think ultimately the question I really want to answer is not so much whether people are, are um, you know, whether there are elevated rates of mobility. I think that's the question we have tended to focus on. I'm more interested in sort of what are the impacts on the long run well-being of children. And I think we don't have enough years yet. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the, I mean, there are, the, like I said, the Davin Reed and Quentin Brummett study, they are able to look over about a 15 year time period. So that's a longer time horizon. And they see no impacts on um, changes in, in well-being, depending on no impacts on differences in well-being, long well-being between the kids who grow up in neighborhoods that's gentrified and those that grow up in persistently low-income neighborhoods. So, yeah. Yeah, very small thought on that. I was thinking about the little services and the time lag, yeah. the types of services and how people access them, how they're diagnosed in yep. different types of neighborhoods. That yep. would also complicate and enhance or possibly yep. that picture. Um, but, but more yeah. broadly, and kind yeah. of meta, I remember you speaking here four years ago, and I saw uh, that preservation. many times <laughs> as an example of big findings and also nuance with clarity. And I wonder if just kind of how you as a scholar and also somebody so engaged in the policy districts decide at what level you want to operate at in terms of big findings and and then you mentioned planners and speaking about planners and the balancing of interests. Right. And obviously, you know, we are big planners right. for right. city policies, but that all of the findings are about the heterogeneity and clustering them, mm -hmm. as you do. I see as a model for mm -hmm. my own work or something that I would aspire to, mm -hmm. but, but I'm just curious how you, how you make those decisions. Yeah. Um, so that's a big question. It's a really, it's a really good question, um, and I think it's sort of study specific. I mean, I, I am a big believer in studying, heter in, in studying heterogeneity. I just think that these, the way, sort of, you know, economic social phenomenon hit our cities and communities. They're just, you know, they don't hit communities in the same way, um, and uh, that. 
you look at something like, I mean, I did a lot of work on the foreclosure crisis, right? If you just sort of look at average effects of the foreclosure crisis and you don't, and you didn't look at differences by race and, you know, racial um, and ethnic composition of a neighborhood, you would miss a big part of, miss a big part of the story. So I think, um, on the other hand, you don't want to sort of fish and just sort of, you know, cut the, cut the data every single way possible. So I think you have to sort of go in with some theoretical reasons for why you think you would see um, heterogeneity, right? Um, and I think, like I said, there are lots of reasons to think that you'd see heterogeneity across communities based on racial composition, across individuals based on racial background by, by income. But I think that's, but I think starting with more theoretical based foundations for, for, for what dimensions of heterogeneity you explore. Okay, can I, is that all right? We can talk more, but I oh, know we, well, sorry. One back here, and then. And what the process is for? Sorry, sorry, during the whole process, like community uh -huh. developments, say, we don't want this. Yeah. Uh, there are many studies about sort of cataloging ways and looking at yeah. you know, different ways of doing that. What happens in those communities afterwards? Um, you know, that's interesting. There's actually there's a wonderful new book that I would recommend to all of you by um, Kate Einstein and co-authors. Um, she's a political scientist at at, um, at BU, and uh, she um, and it's called Neighborhood Defenders, and she basically um, gets she she got data on in Massachusetts they're um, required to make um, transcripts of every single zoning and planning board meeting um, publicly available. And so they went through all those transcripts and she studies sort of the various, they don't so much look over time at what happened to those developments, but it gives you an incredibly nuanced story about sort of uh, who's participating in the community, in these community meetings, who's, who's opposing these developments, what are their reasons. So it gives you a really rich story of the, of the politics but, um, but I think, and you know, and there's certainly anecdotes in that book of, you know, what, you know, often what's go, what happens is you see a development, but it's radically, radically downsized from what was originally proposed. So that's, I think, what what commonly you see. So, Valerie. Thank you so much. Uh, really great um, I uh, I totally understand the rationale for kind of creating this with that autonomy yeah. and these and these. But I think a lot of activists would say, we're not uh, in low-income communities yeah. of color would say, we're not the Indies, we're, we're actually Pimbies. We right. would be for development right. if it were uh, right. public right. housing or affordable at a rate at which mm -hmm. the current cons uh, constituents of the neighborhood could afford. Yeah. Um, and I wonder what you think about, about that sort of proposition, yeah. specifically amid, amidst a time where we're looking at housing finally sort of being taxed on the national stage. People are talking about investing in mm -hmm. housing more than ever before and mm -hmm. at the presidential level in terms of how the Democrats are proposing their housing plans, um, in our city and state in particular, in terms of the sort of gains that the housing movement has seen um, in terms of state legislation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I wonder how you, yeah. how you would position that sort of third. Yeah, that's third a great. Thing. It's a, a great question, and I uh, almost added it last night. I was like, okay, now I already have like 67 <laughs> slides. I can't fit this in. So I'm glad you asked that question. So, so um, on the one hand, um, I mean, I, I am sympathetic to that, to that um, concern, and I certainly would like to see a diversity of housing types built and some, some of those units, whether it's you know, through inclusionary programs. I think we absolutely must preserve the public housing Right, um, the, the developments that, that we have in in this city and around and around the country, they're an, an, a really a critical resource for for low income families. Um, but I worry a little bit about the arguments that we should only be building homes in communities and in low income communities that are affordable to the current residents of those communities. Because what does that do? That really sort of that further deepens or perpetuates concentrations, economic segregation, and potentially racial segregation too. And so um, I'm not, like I said, so I, I'm not, I, I would, in, in my perfect world, you would see 
sort of, you know, mixed in or a range of, you know, housing units built that are affordable to a range of income levels. But I don't think we should only be building units that are affordable to extremely low income households in, in East New York. And then we should be building market rate housing in, you know, in, in, the, in the Brooklyn, Queens waterfront, whatever. It's like that. That's just that's going to just perpetuate segregation. So I think, and that's something I feel like is not something that um, I feel like is, is sufficiently, that that tension is sufficiently engaged with. I so. think Ed Getz did a really good job talking about that in his book, The One-Way Street of Integration. Good. But I think yeah. he touched upon that sort yeah. of notion that receiving communities tend to be low-income yeah. communities of color yeah. because that's where yeah. land that's where is the, right. That's right, that's right. And it also may be sort of a political power question, sure, too. Absolutely. Yeah, again. So, and again, and I think that this sort of gets to Lance's question, too. It's kind of like if you do nothing, then, um, you know, where is development going to happen? It's going to tend to go into lower income communities of color. And so I feel like sort of trying to, if, if we're serious about sort of um, holding every community accountable and say every community has to to do their part and accept some new development if we need to grow, then we have to sort of tip the scales a little bit. Right? So, yeah. I'm curious about that need to grow piece. And the, okay. The, Are you going to challenge that? Good. Um, yeah. oh. I guess my first question, not being a housing person, is um, the media gets really excited when you find large, empty, luxury condo buildings with yeah. investors. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my question is to what extent is that? really reflected in the data, and then if we're talking about policy, um, what, a, what about the prospects of the kind of policies that are limiting sort of higher end demand and the uses of the space as housing, as opposed to sort of the right people that are going to Yeah. So that's a really good question. I mean, I think on the one hand, it is, it is, um, Certainly, looking across the country, that's a very—it's a very unusual phenomenon. These sort of uber luxury buildings. It is, it you know, but there there are some. There are definitely some under under occupied high end buildings in Manhattan, right? It's not even really true. It's not even true outside of Manhattan. It's not true sort of outside of core Manhattan. Um, you know, I don't think. I think part of the issue is it's actually the regulatory restrictiveness actually pushes the market. It pushes developers to build towards the high end of the market, right? Um, and so that's, that's one response. Another response is sort of there are other ways to, to deal with that. I mean, one is sort of, you know, in and, and markets like that, I mean, we can have an aggressive inclusionary housing program, which I think, you know, the de Blasio administration did adopt. And you really can, um, you can demand more from developers when, when the, the profit margins are that high. And you also can be, you know, think about, um, Pieta terror taxes, non-resident taxes, vacancy taxes. I, you know, I think we should be, we should seriously explore those options. And that, to me, would be a, a better way of addressing it rather than saying no, you can't build. Right? It's let's build, but let's extract, let's extract some value there, which then we can redistribute. So. Thank you again. Thank you.